Welcome to the Healthy Heart Show, where we pull back the curtain on conventional medicine and dive into the root causes of cardiovascular health. If you are concerned about high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, or atrial fibrillation, this is the place for you. We will provide natural heart information that will help you prevent, treat, and reverse any ailment, leaving pills and procedures out of the picture. Here are your guides to holistic heart health, board-certified cardiologist and Amazon best-selling author, Dr. Jack Wolfson, and natural heart doctor, naturopathic physician, Dr. Lauren Latanza. Hello, it's Dr. Jack Wolfson, cardiologist. Welcome to another episode of The Healthy Heart Show. And today I'm really excited because I've got uh, a, a PhD in anthropology and archaeology. This is Dr. Bill Schindler. Dr. Bill, welcome to The Healthy Heart Show. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. All right, so let me just give you some of your cred because you got some serious cred and you're not just another kind of a paleo person just uh, going, you know, just talking about what makes sense. You've actually done a lot of research uh, uh, in, in your life and be between what you've read and what you've experienced personally. So we're super excited about uh, to hear about that. Associate professor, uh, professor of anthropology and archaeology at uh, Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. And... Uh, uh, just obviously you've been all kind of all over the internet. You've been interviewed all over about, uh, about your opinions, about your beliefs and really about your studies about, uh, 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 ancestral health and wisdom. So I guess I would say to you, why, why is there so much debate amongst people? Like we don't have to tell a lion or a tiger how to live or what to eat. Why are the humans, why are we so messed up? That's a great question. Uh, and a great, great way to start. You know, we obviously didn't have to ask ourselves those, those sorts of questions in the past, but something's very different about the way that we approach food than any other animal on the planet. And that difference began about three and a half million years ago when we first created the first tool. You know, we have, what I like to say is we, it's unfortunate, but we are probably one of the weakest species on the planet. And that means that we have an incredibly difficult time accessing resources, natural resources from, our, from our, the world around us to use as food. Prior to three and a half million years ago, everything that we collected, everything that we harvested, everything that we ate, we had to gather with our own hands, process with just what we possessed anatomically. And compared to other animals, it's not that much. You know, we're not that fast. We can't swim very fast. We can't fly. We can't climb very well. We can't even dig into the hard ground. So if you think about what our diets were like pre-tool, and I keep saying three and a half million years ago because the oldest stone tool ever found currently dates to 3.3 million years ago, which by the way is the same time period that we start seeing the earliest butchering sites. Um, prior to that time period, our diets consisted of uh, sort of collective foraging of a select few plants, uh, vegetables and fruits and insects. And that's really about it. And that's what our digestive tracts are designed to process. As soon as we started overcoming these physical limitations and creating tools and technologies and behavior patterns to access more resources, we also had to find ways to transform those resources into something that our bodies could deal with because we have a really inefficient digestive tract. And that's what we do. Our dietary past is, is built on three and a half million years of creating incredible technologies that allow us to access the most nutrient-dense various resources from our environment and turn them into the most nutrient-dense bioavailable foods possible. So we do that in a cultural environment. We, we've created these diets, created these technologies, created these behaviors that other animals don't need. We've transcended our limitations We've transcended the limitations of our digestive tract. And in fact, you know, one thing people ask me all the time is, are we designed to eat meat? Are we designed to eat dairy as adults? Are we designed to eat grains? You know, and the list goes on and on and on. And the answer to that question is no. Our digestive tracts are not. However, it's the wrong question. Because that, that question began to become irrelevant as soon as we started creating technologies to overcome those limitations. So it's very difficult for our bodies to completely digest a hunk of raw red meat. But that doesn't make a difference because we create tools and cooking and all sorts of other things to, to break that food down to make it accessible to our bodies. So the question we should be asking is what diets and technologies and behaviors 
or our bodies, our species, and our cultures built on. And it's, it's a complete package. And it's not just about food. It's not, you can't just say, you can't separate meat from all the technologies that surround meat. You can't separate uh, whatever, uh, any kind of food from the technologies that surround it. Because if we do so, we start getting into trouble. And that's our problem today. We're talking about foods that we should be eating, but we're forgetting these technologies that made those foods meaningful for us. So uh, let me take you back, though, to the three and a half million years ago. Was that, uh, w- were those people different from us, though? I mean, those early humans, Certainly. did they have s- other characteristics, I guess, that made them better hunters, better gatherers? Uh, I would assume, you know, and, I, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll, I'll throw it out there to you. To me, I think the pinnacle of man must have been 15,000 years ago when we were the biggest, baddest, strongest people before kind of you invent uh, agriculture kind of came around. And now, I don't know if survival of the fittest is the right terminology, Hmm. because I think obviously our survival is based on adaptations to our environment. Um, But uh, let me me reverse it again. Three and a half million years ago, how how were we different? Any any thoughts on that? Oh, we were very different. So we're different in a number of very significant ways. um, And and very very much all of this is related to diet. So three and a half million years ago, we're talking about Australopithecine ancestors that stood, you know, full size, full grown adults, three and a half feet tall, uh, much, much, much smaller brains. And the females were much smaller than the males were. And all of that is diet related, right? Certainly uh, the females were kept smaller, we think, because the most, uh, the, the highest nutritional times of need in a female's life is when they're young when they're pregnant, when they're lactating. And the highest is actually when they're lactating. And in order to make sure that we do the most important thing we can do as a species and reproduce viable offspring, we start with a lower you know, nutritional need, right? So when we start seeing females of our species uh, getting closer in size to males, it's, it's one of the things that um, suggests that our, that our diets are getting to be of a much higher quality. Uh, so, uh, and again, body size and brain size is much, much less uh, smaller than, and that means our nutritional needs were much smaller than as well. And it's not until we start seeing these major hallmarks of our dietary past uh, occur over, over millions of years that we start seeing our bodies change. So uh, the, the major hallmarks in my mind are uh, th- uh, three and a half million years ago, we create our first stone tools and then start butchering animals. It's the first time meat is in our diet. And the meat that our ancestors at that time were accessing was literally just meat. It was scavenged carcasses from the African savanna. So, uh, you know, you, and, we, and, we, and we see predators today uh, and use them as sort of a correlate to a proxy for the past. Animals, predators will take down another large animal, go in there, eat the organs, the blood, gorge themselves, and then go off and sleep. And during that time when they go off, we can run in there if we have tools and cut pieces of hunks of meat off and then before they come back. So we see meat enter the diet at about three and a half million years ago. But, you know, there's not a huge significant change in brain size or body size then. The most significant change happens, in fact, at about two million years ago. So another million and a half years later when we start hunting. Actually, two things happen then. We start hunting and we start cooking. And when we start hunting, the biggest change is that we have the first access to the animals that we kill. We have the first access to the best parts of that animal. And if it's in, I like to think in terms as many of us do, nutrient density. If it's about nutrient density, meat is much more nutrient dense than vegetables and you know what, but it is the least nutrient dense part of an animal. When we see a significant change in body and brain size, it's at right around 2 million years when we're hunting and we're eating the organs and the blood and the fat and the brains and all of that. And obviously also the meat. Um, and you mentioned 15,000 years ago. Yeah, huge change 15,000 years ago with the introduction of agriculture. But what I, what I will say, the way that I like to look at our dietary past and the, and the role that technology played in it is that we do – we are horrible biologically at getting food and digesting food, but we're incredible using our brains to find ways to transform things that we have absolutely no business eating into incredible, safe, nutrient-dense, bioavailable food. And that doesn't stop at 15,000 years ago because there are incredible things that we can do with certain brains. There's incredible things we can do with dairy. And if you look at many traditional diets, they do. 
Okay, so you know, one of the points you brought up uh, as well is that you know when I spoke at uh, at an event called Paleo Effects, and kind of everybody's going around for their protein shakes, and they're having their, uh, you know, their hamburgers. They're not even like grass fed. I mean, like just so many people in that community. It just, you know, and I've been telling this to my patients for for years, Bill. <laughs> I'm, I'm advising you to eat paleo, but that that does not mean go to Burger King and order a double Whopper, hold the bun. I'm not saying that, um, but. Right. When an animal in the wild kills another animal, they eat the organs and they leave yeah. the carcass, like you said, maybe for later or maybe for never for scavengers. Um, when a when a killer whale in the wild kills a great white shark, it you know knocks it unconscious, goes around, swims and grabs that liver and then takes off. Right. It's it's, yep. it's phenomenal type stuff. Um, how how do we get the organs back into our diet in the 21st century? Yeah, it's a great question. The one that I'm working on, uh, I'm working on that very problem, both at the Eastern Shore Food Lab here at Washington College, but also in my own house. I have three young kids that are part of the, you know, the modern Western world. Uh, and, you know, I, I do think fat, the, the thing that's easy to get into our diets in our modern Western kitchens, it really just take a mind shift because the flavors aren't that often. In fact, the flavors are amazing and it's satiating is reintroducing animal fats into our diets. Very easy to do. I mean, we, we use lard and tallow and duck fat and smalls regularly, marrow. Uh, I mix in, uh, one, one thing we, we butcher at home a lot. We hunt at home. We butcher at home a lot. So this the one thing I like to all one way to do this, and I know this is a roundabout answer to to your question. One of my one of the things I think is the biggest issue with the way that we approach animals today in this in this country and in the Western world in general is that we've taken the face away from our meat, and we need to put it back. Right? It's even so bad. I've worked in a lot of commercial kitchens lately, and, and you know, chefs and people in, in kitchens, they, they use the word protein now. They don't even say, you know, we got to get the protein on the menu. We got to put the protein in the kitchen. And it's, we're not even saying meat anymore. We should be talking about the entire animal. It is not problematic. In fact, it's a beautiful, visceral, wonderful thing to remember and humbling to remember that an animal gave its life so that we can eat. We shouldn't shield ourselves from that for ethical reasons, sustainability reasons, and for health reasons. So in our, in our house, there's a lot of butchering happening, and you know, my kids are around it all the time. So that helps because it's not this foreign, you know, we brought this package in, and then all of a sudden I'm grabbing a kidney out of this. Um, but it is, there are strong flavors. They are that most of us in the modern Western world are not used to. The cool thing is when cooked right, they can still be amazing. But it does take some some work. You can't just slap a cow liver in a pan and expect everybody in the house to, to love it. There's things you know, soaking in milk and those sorts of things that help. Okay. So let me ask you this. Um, so as far as, uh, tell me about the, the benefits of eating the organ meats, I guess, specific to, to the health benefits of that, whether, you know, obviously starting with brain, uh, cause I'm, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's where you're going with that is that obviously once we were able to, you know, eat those organ meats, get the best cuts that led to brain explosion. I've also of course read, uh, that that uh, getting seafood, of course, led to the explosion of our brains as well. Um, so you know, so how much how much do those do, do those organ meats and the seafood play in our brain and body development? You know, that that's a another great question that I am not as well versed in. So I, I'm a I'm a prehistoric archaeologist uh, trained in that world, uh, an experimental archaeologist, primitive technologist. So my my understanding of this is just looking at the core is, is focused mostly on looking at the correlation between when we start seeing things entering the diet. And then when we start seeing, you know, body changes, brain changes, culture changes as uh, social changes as well. So I'm not, I, I don't know all the answers about this specific mineral or component that, that there are vitamin that, that helps with these things. But what I can say is there's definitely a correlation between nutrient density and bioavailability of food and changes in our bodies and also in our cultures. Oh, and, okay, and so one, me, I mean, of, I'm sorry. Well, well, one, one date I also wanted to throw in there very quickly because it's important that I missed in that earlier sort of timeline. 300,000 years ago was the current date we're using for the um, emergence of, of our species, modern day homo sapiens. In, uh, on the planet. So we have these, our, our first tool that allows us to access food and overcome our physical limitations is at actually 3.3 million years ago. Butchering occurs around exactly, or almost exactly the same time. We start seeing hunting and 
probably cooking at 2 million years, a whole host of things happening after that uh, detoxification of plants, fermentation, lots of these things. And then at 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens appear. Homo sapiens appear with the same brain size, the same body size, the same digestive tract size as we do at 300,000 years ago. And they do it at a time when I'm convinced it's the only time they could have because the diet that was there to support these new bodies and brains. What, was it a gradual change or did something on, on a large scale happen, you think, 300,000 years ago? It's a great question that we don't have enough evidence to answer yet. That, that date, that 300,000-year-old date is, is a brand new one. Up until a few years ago, the date was 200,000 years ago. So we don't have, you know, I wish I could say we have, you know, a species in every, you know, 100 years, we have a new example and we could see these changes. We don't have that fineness of a resolution of, of data. But um, the fact that we've been around for 300,000 years is, is pretty significant. Yeah, most certainly. Um, now, what about, uh, where does seafood come into the mix? I mean, I guess kind of like what came first? Were we uh, spear fishing? Were we getting the seafood, getting the mollusks, uh, you know, the clams, the oysters, uh, you know, scallops, et cetera? Where does that come in versus, versus hunting animals? There, there are, I think, the earliest evidence for consumption of fish, and I, I could be wrong here, but I think it's at about, believe it or not, two and a half million years ago on some of the, around two and a half million years ago on some of the Homo habilis sites in Africa, huge remains of huge catfish. Uh, I, I don't think it's at a significant level, but it's there enough that, you know, something we've taken notice of. I... <sighs> It's my impression that hunting land animals is more important early on than the consumption of, of fish, or not necessarily more important, but is it, it, we see more of it. One of the reasons we may see more of it is not necessarily because there was more of it, but because uh, how fragile fish remains are on archaeological sites. Like if, so if there's fish there, the fact that it's, it's very rare that they ever last, even a few thousand years in the archaeological record. I mean, the bones, the, the only true bone in a fish is the, this microscopic right. uh, bone in the ear, right? So seeing the, the remains of these things, it may be, or not seeing them may be more of a product of what we call taphonomic processes, what's happening in the ground more than uh, reflective of then what's happening in the past. Uh, but there's a lot of hunting there's a, a, for, for a long time. And when we do see people in places where there's fish, there's a lot of fishing going on later on. Well, uh, tell me about all the societies in the, in the history of the world that have been vegan. <laughs> I, I just did. <laughs> prehistorically, we have, no, we have no evidence for it prehistorically. Yeah. Yeah. And which I don't think comes as a surprise. All right, so, so one of the things you talk about that um, it's not, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of have this quote I saw from one of your PowerPoint presentations. It's not about eating like a caveman. It's about eating like a human again. And give us some insight as, as to how we bring it back. Because I do have three children, and one of which is 16 months, and she's still, you know, breastfeeding away. Our six-year-old and 11-year-old, uh, you know, their first foods were, were liver, uh, sauerkraut, um, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, sardines, of course, you know, wild sure. salmon, those were their, you know, their original foods. But uh, yeah, I mean, tell us how we, how we eat like humans again. Sure. So it, uh, it's th that, that quote, uh, actually the, the director from the National Geographic show I did, The Great Human Race, he's the one who, he, uh, Brandon Goulish, he, he came up with that quote after me telling him a lot of the trials and tribulations me and my family have been through with, with all this for the past several years. And I'm sure you can uh, connect with a lot of this. I, uh, my, my kids right now are 15, 13, and 11. Uh, about five years ago, uh, and certainly when I had kids, I was so, and I still am very focused on what they're eating, how they're getting it, where it comes from, their connection with it and all this. And, and I still am, but about five, maybe seven years ago, I, kind of went off the deep end and I said, every single thing that goes into their mouths, I'm making 100% from scratch, including, you know, everything that goes into their lunches. But especially with their lunches, I wanted to make sure that they, uh, they weren't ostracized at school for having weird stuff. So I, what, what I tried to do as far as their lunches were concerned was to make every, you know, make their lunches look like the their friends next to their lunches, but it was all 100% made from scratch. And it, and it was. And I was, I was curing all the meats and slicing the ham and making sourdough loaf bread that looked like the other bread. I was all of it. 
making all the cheese, all of it. And it was a great learning year for me, obviously, but I drove every single person in my house mad. I mean, it was, it was, it was too much. I wasn't, cause I have a full-time career. My wife has a full-time career. The kids were involved in all sorts of sports and everything else. And it was so far over the top that I was doing in some cases harm as much as I was helping with their diets. So what we started, I, I the next thing, the next, you know, uh, milestone that I came to is I, 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 I consciously made a decision and the questions I asked myself, I, I decided I was going to pick one of two things to focus on. Am I, is it more important for me to make sure that my, my kids don't get something in their mouths and into their bodies? Or is it more important for me to focus on what, they are getting into their bodies. And I made the decision to focus on what they were getting into their bodies and not be this complete food Nazi on every single thing that they ate and, you know, um, plug them for answers uh, when they come home from a friend's house about what they're eating at their friend's house and all this. And a magical thing happened when I did, uh, when I, when I focused on what they were getting in and, and I, the, the other, the other part, really took care of itself. I mean, they'll, they'll eat something here, they'll eat something there, but they were satiated. They were happy. We weren't driving each other crazy. So um, what I decided to do was, in any, and this is very empowering and liberating, in any situ, if the focus is on nutrient density and bioavailability, and, and I believe that our ancestors' focus has been that for millions of years, that in any given situation, the idea was, how can I get the most nutrition with the least amount of work? I mean, I think that's really what it was like. So if, if that's the approach that you take and transplant that in our modern lives, and whether you be at a grocery store, at the health food store, looking in your refrigerator, wherever you are at a birthday party, if you're looking around and you say, okay, this is my environment that I'm in at this very moment, what steps do I take to get the most amount of quality and nutrition into my body? It's, 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 it's liberating. You're not, you're not sitting there angry about the choices in front of you. You're making do with what you have. And you know what? We've never been healthier. We've never been happier. And that's a part of it. The other part of the human piece of this is the understanding to me that biologically, we are essentially the same as we've been for 300,000 years. Our brains are the same size. Our bodies are the same size. Our digestive tracts are the same biologically for the most part. Certainly microflora, which is, you know, that, that's always changing because of environmental reasons. But biologically, we're essentially the same. So if that's true, and even if there was one diet 300,000 years ago, which there wasn't, and even if I knew what it was, which I don't, I could probably convince somebody to eat that diet based on the idea that that's the diet we as humans should be eating. Exactly that. And you might wake up the next morning and eat the same diet. But in a week, you wouldn't do it anymore. It's, too, it's, it's very foreign to us, the taste, the flavors, the, all, all these things. So what, what, I'm, what I'm working on now, what the focus of all my work is right now is to take this understanding of our bio, or try to get as best I can, this baseline understanding of our biological needs, right? And, and the role that technology and behavior patterns over time played in us meeting those biological needs with the resources around us. But at the same time, understand that culturally, we are very different than we were 300,000 years ago. We're very different than we were 1,000 years ago. We're very different than we were five years ago. And we have different expectations of things like taste and, and texture and smell and presentation and different access to resources and different access to time. And in my mind, any... A uh, way to address our modern issues with food and to address our future issues with food have to take both of those things into account, our biological needs and our cultural needs, and fuse them together in a way that for some, you end up with something that makes sense and is relevant and is meaningful and is accessible. So our diets built us biologically and our diets built us culturally. You know, one thing I also like to say is, is that, and, and I believe this wholeheartedly, every time that we make a selection in the grocery store aisles and put something into our cart every time we, you know, our, our order off a menu at a restaurant, every time we cook at home for our loved ones, every time we take a bite of food, we are expressing to everyone around us much of what we are, our traditions, our religion, our family, our socioeconomic status, our politics, all of those things are expressed through food because it's so intricately linked, food and all of those things in our lives. So we can't separate the two. 
We have to find ways to make all of it work and mesh together to have real solutions. And that's what I mean by learning to eat like humans again, both taking both the biological and the cultural needs and finding a way to fuse it into something that makes sense. The Healthy Heart Show will be right back after we take this quick break to hear from our sponsor. Would you like to drink great tasting coffee that's also good for your heart health? Cardiology Coffee is your answer. This five-star rated coffee is delicious. It's a gourmet coffee that begins with whole organic beans, hand-selected, and carefully roasted. It's tested and certified to be free of pesticides, mold, and other toxins. Cardiology Coffee is great for your heart, and you're going to love how it tastes. Order now online at cardiologycoffee.com. Now back to the Healthy Heart Show. So, so coming in from a cultural standpoint, I guess that, you know, so... How do we how do we bring that in? I mean, are you talking about how we're all kind of sitting around the fire and we're sharing the food, sharing the drink? I mean, um, yeah. How how do you bring that culture back in in a in a society that is clearly more more divisive and every you know mm-hmm. nobody knows their neighbors any anymore. Nobody's outside anymore. Everybody when they're eating, they're glued to technology. Uh, how do we how do we bring that back? Well, I think one way is so. Uh, we just, uh, it's been an eight-year project, but we just recently launched at Washington College uh, something called the Eastern Shore Food Lab. And it's, and it's a, it's a lab, food lab that's set up with the focus of reconnecting people with their food. And it is my hopes that by doing this, we also reconnect them with what it means to be human, with their environment, with their past, with their community, with one another, and even with themselves. And food is the, is the great way, to, is the great vehicle to do this for all those reasons I mentioned earlier. And one of the things that we're trying to do, we're do, trying to do several things. So one way we're trying to do that there and through my work is to, and a lot of this isn't any, anything new, but uh, we're, we're, we're fo- very much focused on it. We are trying to teach people to cook their food 100% from scratch, an entire meal, the meals that they're used to every single day. And when they come in and do that with us, we get to talk to them about, you know, I've, I've done, and I'm continuing to do research all over the world with groups that are engaged and still in traditional forms of, of, of food processing. Um, and it could be something as simple as we were just in Mexico and Oaxaca, uh, mixed tamalizing maize and making tortillas up in the mountains in San Antonio de la Cal. And uh, we're very much focused tortilla, mixed, mixed tamalizing maize and making real traditional tortillas at the food lab is one of the things we're very much focused on right now because it's very accessible to people. So when they come in and, and eat our food or, or cook with us, we get to tell them stories about how this is done still today in the mountains surrounding Oaxaca. We get to tell them about, you know, that we have evidence for this processing for 6,000 years and we have maize that's, uh, you know, uh, it was first domesticated 15,000 years ago and they must have been using a process similar to this in order to um, not, run into difficulties with niacin deficiencies in pellagra. You know, so two things happen when we cook like this and, and teach like this. One is we get to convey, while people are using all of their senses and engaged with their food, we get to convey these stories and these messages and these lessons while they're cooking. And the second thing that happens when people are cooking entirely from scratch is, is they learn the real process for how their food can be made. So in, in my mind, when they go to, if they never do it again, if they never cook it again, they at least can go into the grocery store and can, you know, pull the veil away from all the marketing and advertising and start to at least support the people that are cooking food and, and producing food the right way. That can, that's one way to connect with food in a really meaningful way. And, and again, I think it's that cooking from scratch which really helps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, certainly I, I you start to think, well, I mean, how does one go out? I mean, if one's not a hunter, where does one even learn to hunt or get, you know, getting the food? Um, you know, we're out in Colorado. And we, we hang out at a place called Sustainable Settings, and we try and teach the kids, you know, th- these are the chickens. And I've, my oldest one has watched the chickens being slaughtered. We haven't, done it, we haven't done it personally, but we're gathering the eggs. We've, you know, done the hand milking on the raw milk and shot at my, like, you know, six-year-old's eye, you know, and the whole thing. <laughs> had a great time, you know, with that. Um, but, uh, and, you know, but back to the children, well, like you said, I mean, it's like, you know, society is so against everything with the, you know, 
trying to raise children in this kind of way and you're right they're sure. ostracized and and you know the, the five-year-old the six-year-old the seven-year-old they don't really know but once the child gets to be you know nine ten eleven uh and and i think this is why it's so important to edge and i'm sure you of course have done that with your children as well is to really educate them right from the beginning on why we're doing this the importance of doing this and sadly the health ramifications on what's happening to the other children from those behaviors, um, yeah, it's really just, you know, it's, uh, it, we felt it's really just the educational piece, you know, with the kids. You know, and you know, uh, the one thing that's, one of the, uh, easy isn't the right word, one of the most accessible ways, I think, in addition to, to cooking with your kids, uh, that we find to, to really connect our kids with their food and their environment, uh, all, all of us, our entire family, is foraging. You know, and, and, and foraging, I think, is such a wonderful way to do that because you can do it anywhere. You know, this, this Saturday, I'm giving an, uh, a, I do an urban foraging tour in, in the middle of Washington, D.C. every year, and it's one of my favorite tours. Every, I do a bunch of them in the woods. I do a bunch of them in suburban areas, but this one in the middle of D.C. is so cool because it's typically people from that area that come in. They've walked the same streets their entire lives, and we go out there, and in two hours, they, they'll never look at those streets the same way again. You know, we, we, go, we forage for about two hours and come back and cook for, for two or three hours. Um, you can forage anywhere that you are. Uh, you can, and even if you're not actively foraging, once you start to get into it a little bit, you're looking out the, the windows of the car, you're riding your bike, you're jogging, and you're looking, you're watching plants grow and go through different cycles and when they're edible and when they're toxic and when they're not. And that is such a meaningful way to reconnect with something that has been a part of our diets for the entirety of our existence and has only recently been taken away from us. Um, you get to address issues of things like, you know, here, here's a great example. We, we, we talk about things like, there's taboo. When I talk about food and diet, there's taboo words that people don't like to use. And one of them is the word toxic. You know, if I say the word toxic, all of a sudden, you know, it's okay, that's a whole category of something that shouldn't even be in a conversation about food. But the reality is most staples in traditional diets around the world are based on plants that they're that their wild version was toxic and many of their early heirloom varieties were toxic and a potato is an amazing example. Uh, all the wild potato is highly toxic and uh, most of the heirloom varieties of early potatoes were highly toxic and some of the ones that are still under cultivation still are. Manioc, these sorts of things. The fact that it's toxic doesn't mean we can't eat it. We just develop technologies to detoxify these plants and get, get around them. And these are the basis of our diets for thousands and thousands, if not of years, if not, if not longer. You know, we are the only, and so, you know, having a conversation about foraging and toxicity and, and, and seasonality and detox, all these things, you know, open people's minds to what diets really can be and what they might have been like in the past. You know, we're the only, I, this, is, this is what I understand. We're the only plant-eating animal. Not that we should just eat plants, but we do eat plants. We're the only animal that eats plants that doesn't also intentionally consume earth any longer. And, you know, there, there's certainly detoxification reasons, you know, or, or reasons for engaging in geophagy. And the potatoes, one, you know, in Peru, there's still a few groups in, in the mountains, in the Andes, where they're still eating a, a toxic variety of potato. And the way they detoxify it is through these clay dips. They dip the potato in this, in this cauldron of mud and then eat it. And the toxins bind with the clay and pass, pass through our bodies. Wow. wow. So I, I'm actually going there this summer to do some work. But it, it, the, that, the, walking around and seeing your lawn as something different is, is so much better in so, so many ways. So foraging is great. I also think, and it's for, especially for kids, and we don't like to think that way, right? The idea is that, oh my gosh, kids and plants, and you put something in their mouths and teach them how to feed themselves, and all of a sudden you're making, you know, our, the, the modern view of it is that we are endangering our kids by showing them what they can eat. And it, that's, that's not the case. You know, we are empowering our kids by showing them what they can eat and giving them a view of the world that most of us didn't grow up with. The other thing I think is really important is the butchering piece. If you're going to have meat in your house, I think it's a responsibility that there's at least some connection that there was a life that was lost to feed you and, and your family. So, and I don't mean you have to bring a half a cow into the kitchen and have blood everywhere. You know, even bringing, 
even taking that step from buying chicken breast to buying the entire chicken is a huge step. And for many people, it's a step that is a leap. But by doing this, you're seeing a carcass, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling, you're, the smell, all of those things are very important. And on top of it, you've also taken a step, you know, a zero waste sort of step where you have a whole carcass and instead of one meal from that chicken breast, you have three, three or four meals out of that chicken. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, as we're having this conversation, I'm kind of staring out into the grass uh, where, where I'm at and there's dandelion all over. And one of my favorite things in the world is dandelion greens, mm -hmm. something that growing up in Chicago, we would see dandelions all the time. I never even heard of the concept of a dandelion green because I would see the dandelions on our way to Dairy Queen or, or McDonald's or something. And um, the but you, know, but you mentioned lawn. I mean, so lawn to me implies grass. I'm going to assume, obviously, you're not talking about foraging through your grass and the idea of maybe having some kind of, you know, the edible landscape, which I think, I mean, can you imagine, I, I, Bill, you got to agree with me on this, why anybody in the 21st century should plant this variety of grass, whatever this genetically modified grass is, where nothing else grows, when you can just plant edible plants and flowers <laughs> And that should be your lawn, and it's it's spectacularly beautiful. Uh, you know, uh, can we get back to that? What do you think? Uh, sure, but I will. Uh, I will also say that unless you're dousing your lawn with all sorts of of uh, herbicides and, and other nasty things, the when, if you really take a close look. There's a lot of stuff in there besides just the grass, and that's a beautiful thing. And let me tell you a very, very quick story. I, so my father had me hunting, fishing, trapping, camping, hiking since I was a young kid, uh, very young. But the one thing that I started doing on my own, and I, I grew up in New Jersey uh, in the suburbs of New York City. One thing I started doing on my own was foraging, and I started foraging when I was 10. And I got a Peterson field guide, one of the little Peterson field guides then, and um, every time I found a plant, and I'd look at it every night and I'd pick the plants I wanted to find and I'd go out and I'd go to the parks and I'd go places to go and find these woods and I'd go and find the plants. And every time I found one, I identified one, I'd take a leaf and I'd put it in the page where that plant was, you know, and my, my one inch thick book became, you know, really, really thick over the years. But there were just some plants that I couldn't find and I couldn't identify. And this went on for years. And it would say in the field guide that it grew in my area, but I couldn't find them. So many, many, many years later, I went to a, a foraging tour with a, in Central Park with a guy named Wild Man Steve Brill. I don't know if you ever heard of the Wild Man Steve Brill, but he's, he, he's something else. Uh, and to make a very, very long story short, uh, he would run these foraging tours. I think he still does. And we, we met him at the entrance to Central Park right by the Museum of Natural History. And you'd meet him and everybody would give him 10 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever. And he'd collect all the money. And then we started walking and I could see the woods in the distance. And I, I see the woods and he start walking, we're following him. And I'm thinking, okay, let's go. It's going to be a 10 minute hike. And he walked about 15, 20 steps. He did it on purpose. <laughs> Turned around and said, look at your feet. And I looked down at my feet and I saw the grass, that the same grass that I saw when I walked in. And he's like, no, look. And as he started identifying what was actually at our feet, I started realizing that some of those plants that I never identified, i have been walking over my entire life. And when I went back home, they were in my parents' lawn, and I had been living within feet of these plants that I've spent years trying to find. So, you know, these basic things like, you know, cat's ear and chicory and da the dan you can eat the entire dandelion plant, the entire thing, not just the leaves, uh, are, are there. And you don't have to go into the woods to find them. You can find them in the cracks of the sidewalks. You can find them in your lawns. You can find them everywhere. And does that have to be uh, processed in any way whatsoever? I mean, obviously dandelion greens, I mean, I've, I've, you know, gone through farmer's markets with big, beautiful ones and they're all organic and of course all that stuff. And I'm just, you know, sitting there in the market eating them, right? The dandelion flour, nothing of that has to be processed, right? You just go eat it and you're good to go. Yeah, the, uh, the, the flour is fine. The, the, uh, underneath the flour, there's a green part that's a little bit bitter. You, you, you might not enjoy the taste of. But yeah. you, the, the, to me, the best part of the dandelion is the crown, the part between the leaf and the beginning of the root. It's like the, the oyster of the dandelion. It's amazing, raw or cooked. The, the root can be steamed or boiled or, 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 or uh, processed in a lot of different ways. And the cool, one of the cool things, too, is if, you're, um, if you have some of those huge dandelions, the stem – 
like when it, that makes an incredible straw. Oh, cool. for, for really cool, like special specialty drinks. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but we should play with our food. We should, we should do these things. And I love it. I love it, Bill. That's awesome stuff. Um, uh, just to throw out some basics at you, uh, uh, percent animal versus a uh, plant in our diets. Yeah. Actually, I, I never thought about it. I don't know. Right, forget I forget it then. Uh, well, you know, I, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, uh, there's a book that I read, um, in researching, I, I was recently asked to write a chapter in a integrative cardiology textbook. And of course they asked me to write the, they asked me to write a few different chapters. And I said, you know what? I know you appreciate this as a father. I've got the bandwidth for one chapter and <laughs> that's all I could do right now. So we said, all right, write the chapter on paleo nutrition. And I found a ton of literature on, on paleo nutrition for cardiovascular um, uh, benefits. But one of the books that I came across was called The Stone Age Diet by Walter Vogelin from the mid-1970s. And Vogelin was a gastroenterologist, and it's an amazing book you can find on PDF. I don't even think it's in print version. But that was his whole thing is that he kind of breaks down the, you know, the digestive tract of, of humans versus you know, various animals. And he says, you know, we are definitely uh, – we are – omnivores, but we much more, are, we're closer to carnivores. And he comes up and he says two thirds animal versus plants. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, one thing that I would caution in the, in the uh, one thing that you, you soon find out in the anthropology and archeology span world is that the information that we're dealing with is, is fragmented. It's biased in many ways, especially uh, and our job is to make sense and interpret this information, right? That's what we have to do. And as we learn more, the same information is getting reinterpreted, reinterpreted. And that's, that's a very cool, exciting thing. But it, when you're looking at ethnographic sources, we always have to remember who is doing the recording, what their background was, what their intent is, uh, what their bias is. And quite often the, the, the sources that we're looking at are, uh, documented by a group that's going in to conquer another group and they are writing down what they see f through you know filtered through their own eyes and for whatever purpose they're writing it down for and quite often a lot is missed that way and I, and I, and this is in very much support of the, this meat fat thing anyhow but I give you one very quick example of um, the first time that I really thought about this about Eight years ago, I was doing work in Denmark, and I was working with some Inuits from Greenland who happened to be at the same event that I was at. And there was a woman there who was the last surviving woman who makes these amazing toddler coats out of a bird called a little auk. And the little auk is a very small bird, but it's full of fat. And she, it takes something like 50 or 60 birds to make this one coat that'll last one child one year. Wow. She's the last surviving person to do it. And I watched her give this demonstration. She used her Ulu knife and cut this bird. It put, she took the skin off of this bird in one of those magical ways I ever saw. And it has to be exact. And then she went through the, the steps of how to tan this, this little bird's skin and then showed us how to sew it later on. But anyhow, that, I asked her if she could show me one-on-one -on -one later. She said, absolutely. So that night and the whole next day, um, we were butchering these birds. And then I was tanning one myself and this is the process for the tanning once you get the skin to keep the feathers on it keep get the skin off of this bird and the birds about you know the size of your fist you turn it inside out and you start with the head of the skin and you put it in your mouth and you have to suck all the fat out of the skin it's the first step in the tanning process and and as you suck, you keep sticking it in your mouth more until the entire bird's in your mouth. And it takes, it's, it's over like four hours for one bird. And she bragged that her and her mother were the only two people in her group that could, or, or I think it was her mother was the only person who could fit a whole duck inside of her mouth, the skin inside out with the feathers. But anyhow, so I did. And at the end of this four or five hours, I have sucked. This is the fattiest bird I've ever seen in my life. I have sat there and sucked the fat out of skin for four hours. Now, this woman, and in the past, it would have, wouldn't have been just her, would have done hundreds and hundreds of birds like this over a several-month period to make all the coats needed to, to do this. Well, I went back and looked to see. You know, I'm thinking to myself, what 
amazing nutrition that I take in over these four or five hours. And I went back and I, and I looked at all the ethnographic references I could find about diet documented for people doing this. And none of it mentioned this process. Hmm. And if you watched it, and if you were just trying to, even if you were focused on technology and how people were tanning skins, you know, you'd be documenting this for the purpose of understanding how to tan these skins. But you completely miss, you know, the amazing nutrition that this woman has been taking in for, you know, months every, every, every single year. And I mean, it is high quality, amazing nutrition. So I, I, the information that's out there is has to be waded through, but there's a, there's a lot more that can be done with even what's there. And I think we're only literally scratching the surface of what's possible for us finding out about what our diets were like in the past. Fantastic. Uh, Bill, it's an absolute pleasure, man. I could talk to you and pick your brain uh, forever. This is such fascinating, fascinating stuff. And, uh, and once again, you know, you go to some of these conferences and it's just a bunch of people just kind of, you know, once again, reading the literature and debating it, but you've been in the field where, where I, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt my listeners and the people who watch the video are going to want a lot more information about you, sure. about your work and about kind of the whole lifestyle that you're talking about and talking about creating work. We find out more about you. Okay, there's a couple great places. Thanks, thanks for asking. So my website is uh, www.drbillschindler.com. So it's drbillschindler.com. Uh, we have the, uh, the Eastern Shore Food Lab at Washington College, the, the new project that I'm working on. Uh, you can find that at www.washcoll.edu backslash ESFL for Eastern Shore Food Lab. Uh, and then you can follow you can follow me at Dr. Bill Schindler on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We keep a very active social profile, and also uh, my family we're we're called the Modern Stone Age family uh, is at the Modern Stone Age family. Same thing. We keep a very active uh, social media presence. So please uh, feel free to to follow us. And if anyone has any questions uh, or wants to communicate, you can find my email address on there as well. So you guys eat those big uh, brontosaurus burgers and ribs just like the Flintstones, right? <laughs> this is something like that for sure. Awesome. 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 All right. Dr. Jack Wolfson, another amazing episode of the Healthy Heart Show. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That does it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Healthy Heart Show. Please help us get the word out by liking and subscribing to our podcast and our Facebook page, Natural Heart Doctor. Please show support for our podcast sponsor, Cardiology Coffee your resource for organic, antioxidant-rich, mold and pesticide-free coffee ships straight to your door. Learn more by adding at Cardiology Coffee on Instagram and visiting cardiologycoffee.com. This podcast provides materials for information and educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. We encourage you to contact your physician for any of the health issues discussed here.